So tonight I'm going to be talking to you about uh, motion control devices that have given us this ability to have this kind of futuristic interaction with our computers. This first one is called the Leap Motion Controller, and it's this little device that I have here in front of my computer. Although this technology has been around for a while, it's now gotten to a point where it's very cheap, very accessible, and can give people like you and I the ability to play with, interact with, create for this type of device. I have a lot of exciting stuff to show you tonight, so if I skip through some of the video content, rest assured that I have everything on my website, and you'll be able to visit these links later and watch them in their entirety. What? So I'm also going to be talking about a device uh, that you've probably heard of called the Microsoft Kinect for the Xbox 360. Woo! Uh, the Kinect came out a few years ago and it was immediately hacked by artists and programmers who wanted to do something experimental, creative, artistic with it. So uh, the Kinect works by projecting a grid of infrared light and it has sensors that can read that infrared light and interpret the way that it bounces off of your body. And it reconstructs a version of yourself in the computer and places you in 3D space. The Leap Motion also uses infrared light. No one really knows how it works because they're kind of hush-hush on the patents. But the Leap Motion kind of works in a similar way. So it's one thing to have this kind of raw point cloud data. It's another thing to be able to do something useful with it. This is a program that comes with the Leap Motion device. And it kind of shows what's going on here. So you see my hand here? This device is able to very quickly and very accurately detect the location of my finger with very little latency. It's kind of crazy, right? It's also able to detect the orientation of my hand, the direction it's pointing, the speed at which all of this is moving. And if I, if I move the camera here, you can see that this is, this is actually fully three-dimensional. It's not just left and right and up and down like a touch screen. I'm actually also moving in the Z dimension, in the third dimension. So you go from, you go from that kind of raw point cloud data to something that's more useful, like what is the position of my finger? And you can start to do, or my hand, you can start to do cool things like this. So this is a lab that got hold of a lead motion controller and used it to control a quad rotor. I don't know if you can see what's going on there, but there's, a, there's like a little hovering machine that's in the air and the guy's controlling this thing with his hand, hovering over one of these lead motion devices. So this is, this is for all of you who are, might be interested in kind of the, the physical computing side of things. So, in addition to getting this information about where's my finger, where are my hands, what's the orientation of everything, the programmer or the artist or the creative person who's taking that data has to do something further with that uh, in order to make a compelling experience. So, I'm going to show you a couple of different things here. When I first started playing with this device, the first thing I wanted to try was, was drawing in three dimensions. So if I hold the space bar down, I'm actually creating a kind of sculptural 3D drawing. And this is, this is made in such a way that you could send this output to like a 3D printer. You could use it for uh, really anything that you wanted to. What I want to kind of communicate to you is, as I talk about this stuff is kind of just the, the possibilities with this are endless. It's kind of whatever you can imagine is most likely possible. And the barrier to entry is very low uh, because these devices are so cheap. And all the software and all the things related to learning how to do this is either open source or very accessible. So another thing you have to think about when you're working in three-dimensional space is how are you going to control the camera. So 
there's different ways that we might be able to say. Sorry. Different ways we might be able to do this. So here I've got a, a little experiment where if I reach into the space and close my hand and drag with one hand, I'm moving the camera in three dimensions. Okay? If I reach in, this is a little difficult to do without a lavalier mic, but if I reach in with two hands and close both fists, I'm able to rotate this three-dimensional view. <laughs> So one of the uh, you know one of the things that I ran into with doing this is uh, there's many many ways to accomplish the same thing right so maybe that's too kind of clunky maybe it's too hard to teach somebody how to reach in and do ex explicit gestures so maybe you want to do something where it's just going to recognize a swipe right this is a lot easier add a little momentum right I can swipe across I can swipe left to right I can swipe up and down. And because there's a little bit of momentum on the camera, it's going to kind of feel more immersive, right? You see this kind of thing in, in iPhone apps and different stuff like that. So let's take a, take a look at another uh, possible extension of using this kind of a device. Somebody else's, but this is an example of what you might do to create a musical instrument. So for, for all you musicians out there, I really like the, uh, the degree to which he considered how to use this device. When you saw position-dependent timbre, that means that as you got closer to the end of the virtual harp string, it sounds different than when you pluck it in the middle. So of course, we've been exposed to this kind of futuristic interface in movies for many, many years. Here we have uh, Minority Report and Iron Man. And most of the movies that we see kind of occupy a space between what's currently available. So we have the leap motion. This thing can detect my hands within a few uh, feet from the device. We also have another, the other device I'm going to talk about, the Kinect, which can detect more of your full body motion. Most of what we see in the movies, this, these are some other frames, one from Prometheus and one from Tron Legacy, are kind of a combination of very high fidelity hand motion plus body motion plus holographic display. So we're not, we're not quite there yet, but we're getting there. I'm going to show you an example of something that uh, some artists have done with a Kinect. This is one you really got to go back and, and watch the rest of because what they do with that point cloud data is really, really amazing. This is another example of what some artists have done with a Kinect, uh, this time kind of a different genre. I guess I'm not getting my sound. Uh, something's going on with the sound now, but... Um, yeah, basically you can see that uh, the, the Kinect is recognizing the position of the people's hands and they're able to control these virtual puppets. 
And then there's some other devices that are recognizing the position of the kids in front of the screen. They're able to kind of shoot this food up into the air and the puppets come in and kind of eat the food. Very, very amazing stuff that's going on. So now I'm going to show you something that I've been working on. It's called Beautiful Chaos. So, I'm using my hands to control this. You're seeing basically a cloud of colorful points whose positions are determined by a math equation, if you're into math. If you're just into cool things, you can just be into cool things. For some reason, I think I'm losing my connection to the leap, but let me show you this a little bit more some different color modes. If you want to play with this afterwards, we don't have a, a huge amount of time, but um, you can definitely come up and give it a shot. I've done a lot of work um, with this type of math equation in the past, creating still images and videos in my fine art practice. And this is the first time that I've been able to kind of have something that it allows me to explore this in such a kind of intuitive fashion. So at this point you might be thinking, okay, that's all well and good, but this stuff is way beyond my league. I don't even know the first thing about programming or anything like that. Well, that's why I have this slide for you. So a few things I want to mention and then you can talk to me more about them later and also look on my website. The first three on the top are three pieces of software that are specifically designed for artists, musicians, architects, creative people who might not have exposure to programming, but who want to harness the power of the computer and get into this stuff. Uh, the one that I would recommend starting out with is called Processing, and then the other two are called Open Frameworks and Cinder. If um, you want some help in doing this kind of thing, I encourage you to check out a group that I'm starting called Processing Orlando. Thank you very much. We've only had one meeting. I have to set the second meeting, but basically we're going to get together and kind of learn how to do these things together. Um, have some workshops, have some intro tutorials, have some show and tell, see what, see what people locally here in the Orlando area are doing with, with this kind of thing. Obviously you've got the Leap, the Connect, uh, and then in terms of uh, inspiration, there's no shortage of inspiration on the internet, of course, but three sources that I want to mention to you uh, where a lot of the projects that I showed you today are covered are on the bottom. One is called the IO Festival. Uh, it's only been around for a few summers, but they put all of their talks online on Vimeo for free, and they're fantastic. Uh, the other two are the Creative Applications Network and the Creators Project, and they both continually cover in kind of a blog post format really interesting creative uses, intersections of art and technology. One more thing I want to show you is, I just want to show you this is really, really easy. You don't so obviously you're not going to be able to really read this, but uh, this is not a lot of code, right? This is, this is, in terms of program length, this is probably, if you took out all the comments, which are the, the parts that kind of are for humans to read, and you just cut it down to what the computer's reading, you probably have 15 lines of code, okay? But this is built with processing, which is one of those tools that I mentioned. And let me just move the screen over here. 15 lines of code, you can plug in this device, get your fingers on the screen, right? It's one thing to get your fingers on the screen, but the, the great thing about these programming languages is that they're really fun and easy to play with. And bring it back over to the screen where I can see what's going on. So this is the kind of process that, that, that we go through here. So what if I didn't clear the background? Instead of before I drew a frame, what if I drew the, the circles from my fingers without clearing the background?
all of a sudden I have a really cool kind of, you know, beginning of an experiment, right? This is why artists love this stuff, because it's so visual and it's so accessible. Okay, what if I, instead of having like a, a constant radius for those circles that are drawn at my fingertips, what if I based it on the depth of where my finger was? I'm going to go back to clearing the screen. So now all of a sudden, as I rotate my hands and my fingers get closer to me, I've got bigger circles and I've got a, a nice sense of depth, right? What if instead of doing that, I base the size of the circle on how fast my fingers are moving? Okay? So I'm just trying to show you, like, these are really small tweaks and kind of the joy and the, and the, the experience of creative coding or creative programming is being able to change these things and hit play and watch it and see what it does and make mistakes and go down rabbit trails and you know all sorts of different things that you don't really know where you're going to end up. <laughs> so that's about it for me. Um, here's some ways you can get in touch with me. You might have to come up here to read the text a little bit small. Yeah. <laughs>